Okay. Oh, you need one too. Happy Wednesday. So, today is obviously Wednesday. Announcements. First thing, we're going to start at the bottom actually. Changes to the SI schedule. On Tuesdays, it's from 7 to 8. Yesterday, it was from 6 to 8. For the mini exam review, next Tuesday, it will return to 7 to 8. Check the schedule. She'll send you an announcement. However, there are two changes due to other conflicts. So on Tuesday, we're going to start a half hour later at, nope, 15 minutes later at 4.45 and go to 5.45. And it's in the room that I said it was in, B. On Friday, it starts at 12.30, which is earlier, right? Oh, no, no, no. It is once at 12.35. It's an hour early. Oh, man, I was like, I don't know. I thought that's what we said. So it starts an hour earlier at 1230. There were a bunch of conflicts for students. So we would like to apologize if this made it inaccessible to you. But hopefully you guys can start attending. What are you guys covering tomorrow? Nomenclature, Nomenclature which we're going to talk about at the beginning. Other things. Every Monday you have Alex objectives due at midnight. They are pretty much there every week from now until the end of time. Um, I would recommend not waiting until Monday at 10 p.m. to start. It's not a bad thing, but if you email me at 11.58 that you're riding the struggle bus, I might be awake, but like I don't think I can coherently respond to you in a way that will be assistive, and me telling you on Tuesday morning, also not going to help. So if you start them early, I have office hours on Monday from... 12 to 2, you can come on Zoom. We'll work problems until we're blue in the face or that. Questions about either the SI schedule or the Alex objectives. Yeah. So today is our first mini exam. It's at the end of class. So we are going to lecture first and then have a mini exam. The way this will work is the mini exam is all inclusive. So if you brought your periodic table, that's super. We're going to need it in class. But on the mini exam, it is already there. So it will be a front cover sheet. Then a periodic table. I tried to save the environment. It'll never be this compact again. This was a terrible idea. Then your, what is this? Conversion factors and like one equation. More questions, more questions. And the back is where you will find your score. So for 35 minutes at the end, you will basically work on this. Um, things to note. One, when, when we say it's time, pack up all of your belongings. That includes your phone. Um, so that when you are done, if you finish before time is called, you can basically just bring your stuff down with you and leave. Um, it prevents what I like to call the shuffle, where you go back there, and I don't know what you're looking for in your bag, but it's like you're Santa, looking for everything in there. It's kind of distracting. Um, so basically, when you're done, you can leave as soon as you're finished. Out, well, probably out the front door so that you can hand it to me. Um, there's a periodic table included. So all you will need is a writing implement and a calculator, which hopefully you guys brought. Um, we'll address that when we get to it. Are there any questions about today's mini exam other than, like, what's on it? Ooh, I'm glad you're here for this question. And like, it's, they were on the, like, so some, so the worksheets are a little old. So I've adapted some of the things. And we are going to talk a little bit about naming. So the naming is on mini exam two. So every day until then, we're going to do like, I don't want to call it a tidbit of naming. So we'll talk about it for five to seven minutes. But in general, if the metal is in the middle, in the transition metals, you should use Roman numerals. At other points in both the textbook and other things, there are some transition metals that only have one state. So like zinc is a good, is a good example. Zinc can only be two plus, but it's in the transition metals. And it becomes really hard to try to like remember that. 
So while it is slightly unconventional, because if it only has one state, you don't need to include that. But from here on out, I will ask you to always just include that if it is a transition at all. As long as you and I row in the same boat, I don't really care where we go. Any other questions? The common ion table, hopefully you didn't spend all day today like furiously memorizing that. It will be on the next one. So today you will use part of that information, but it will not be, you don't need to have it memorized. What was your question? Yes, so you do need to know the metric prefixes for, I think it goes from plus 9 to negative 12. I'm getting some nods of affirmation, which is great. Um, that will definitely be on this exam where you will be able to convert from nanometers to meters or nanometers to megameters or whatever it is along those lines. Any other questions? So the first thing we are going to do today is to think about naming. No, that's not what I want. So naming. One of the things with naming is there's kind of two different parts of this that we're going to think about. There's a reason I'm not a like basketball star. I had a good marker earlier, so oh, here we go. So naming. There's two different ways that we're going to be able to think about this. There's chemical formulas. These are the elements. For example, NaCl or Na2SO4. So a chemical formula basically is just the elements strung together. When we start to think about a chemical name, I don't want to say these are words because that feels kind of silly, but in actuality, it is the longer version of the name. So instead of NaCl, it would be sodium chloride. So a couple of, I don't want to call them fun facts because I'm not sure where they're all the way to fun. But we name things cation to anion. So it is the cation, which is the positive ion, to the anion. And so typically, with the exception of like a very, very minute thing, it is the metal to the non-metal. This is the left side, this is the right side of the periodic table. So this periodic table doesn't have a marker where it says what is a nonmetal and what is not. Pretty much, if you go from boron and draw a diagonal line to the other end, give or take, those are all in the top quadrant are going to be nonmetals. The periodic table is predominantly metal. So when we think about this, we are going to start with how we would name the cations, and then we'll talk about the anions. So the first things are the metals. So the metals, it turns out that their name is just their name. Now you're like, what? So if we think about Na, this is sodium. And it turns out that that doesn't change. So the name on the periodic table is the name of the element in the chemical name. So if you were to think about a transition element, that would be, so vanadium, vanadium 3 plus would be vanadium, followed by capital Roman numeral 3. This tells you the oxidation state. So earlier you asked about cadmium. 
Cadmium is a transition metal. I think cadmium can also only have one state. So at different points, both when I've taught this course and when the book has different iterations, and Alex, I'm sure, will have its own opinion about this. But the reality is, if it is in this transition metal, no rules kid block, we are always going to use the Roman numeral for things that I create. Now, if Alex has a meltdown, which it might, follow Alex's rules, and I will adjust accordingly. There, overall, or overwhelmingly, things in the transition metal bucket require the ability to have a Roman numeral. So the Roman numerals tell us that multiple charge states are possible. For example, we can have iron 2 plus or iron 3 plus. And you would write that iron 2 or iron 3. Roman numerals, it's basically I, I, I. I don't really want to say all these because we'll be here all day. The most you're going to see is 7. Occasionally there's an 8, but we don't really see oxidation numbers past that because that would mean that you just basically removed every electron, all of them, and that's not really possible. So when we think about the metal components, their name is the element name. Now, it feels like I told you how easy this is, and so I'm about to turn around and be like, oh my god, the anions are so hard. It turns out they're not. But their name has one small change. So when we think about the anions, some of them might be oxygen or chlorine. These change, they make a single change, they get a different suffix. This part changes to IDE. So we have oxide or chloride. So when we name them, the metal is the metal, is the metal. For a single element anion, it basically goes to the I. Nitride, chloride, sulfide, telluride, which is a little weird because that feels like we're going on vacation, but terillium turns into, maybe not telluride, but we'll go with that. That's the biggest change there's going to be. Now, if we have a polyatomic anion, yeah, those, there are different ways that you can think about polyatomic. These are ions that contain a bunch of elements together and they live in a group. So we could have nitrate, which is NO3 minus, and nitrite is NO2 minus. These are the things on the back of your green sheet. If you started working in Alex, Alex has a list that's like, I don't know, 40 times longer than this. They also have a common ion table. It's actually better than mine, but it just has a lot of things on there. These are the ones that I will use on the exam. If I use something else, like let's say I get crazy and pick some weird anion that no one's heard of, like citrate. I'm going to say, here is the ion. I'm going to give you the chemical name and the chemical formula, and we can go from there. But for these, there are mnemonics for how to tell the difference between phosphate, phosphite, hypophosphite, I find that it is best to use what I like to call the classic memorization techniques. Some flashcards or a quizlet, if you want to go that crazy. Just make some flashcards, learn them that way. You can learn them any other way that makes you happy. I find that the mnemonics get a little busy and people try to remember all of the things all at once. What you are responsible for when we get to mini exam two, so in two weeks, if I say, given the chemical formula, what is the chemical name? You should be able to come up with that. Or if I give you the name and we go to the formula. So today, where did my paper go? We have some examples. This 
We have K2O, KCL, NAF, KCL3, and NIOH2. So I'm going to start erasing the board, making sure this is where I want it to be. What I want you to do is try to come up using your periodic table, the chemical name for these five compounds. How many of you have named all five? So what is the chemical name for the first one? We got a potassium oxide. Oh, those are like not letters. Sorry. Do we have any questions about potassium oxide? Nope, kind of makes sense. What about the next one? Potassium chloride. And the one after that? Chloride sometimes has a U in it. I use both spellings. You may also use both spellings. Spelling is Here's when spelling matters. If you have nitrate and nitrite, you can't do that thing where you try to like, you don't know which one and you make it look like both and then we just kind of hope that we all get to the same page, whatever the right answer is. That's when spelling really matters. Magnesium, if you get most of the letters and I can tell that's where you were trying to go, that works for me. Maybe like iron or things that are like pretty normal elements. I'm gonna hope you can spell that. But spelling is not the biggest part of this. So what about this one here? Okay, so I hear a lot of vanadium, some threes, and a lot of chlorides. I also heard the pretty classical vanadium chloride, where we're like, I'm not really sure. So in this case, vanadium is a transition metal, right? More often than not, you have to look at the periodic table. If it is found in the transition metal box in the middle, then it has to have Roman numerals. That is the easiest way to do it. There are a handful like silver and zinc, maybe cadmium, that only have one state. It's gonna make it easier on all of us if we just always include these. However, for things in the first, second, first and second column, or the, anything not in the transition metal cannot have a parentheses in there. So it's not sodium one, because sodium can only be one oxidation state, just so we're all clear. It's the things in the middle, yes, everything else, no. So what about this last one? 
Nice. Nickel two, I dropped that. So what questions do we have about how to arrive at the chemical name from the chemical formula? Next week, we will work on going the opposite direction. And on Wednesday, we will talk about using, there are, occasionally you get these super cool compounds like dihydrogen monoxide, which is just water, where they have two nonmetals. And in a non-chalking twist, they get special rules. So in that case, we will learn those prefixes next week. We're trying this, learn our naming in little bits, because otherwise it's too much information all at once. Yes? The uh, Roman numerals come from the suffix, right? So the Roman numerals come from the charge on the vanadium. So the vanadium BCL3, the Roman numeral tells you the charge. So it's not necessary, it corresponds to the subscript, but you could also have, hold on, we're working on. So if you had vanadium two, Vanadium 3, PO4, 2. This, the question here is what is the charge on this? So a phosphate ion has a minus 3 charge. So together you would have a minus 6 charge. Divided by the 3 would give you a vanadium 2. Phosphate. Where this one here, because the chlorine, chlorine is a negative one, that means this vanadium has to be a plus three. Because it is based on the corresponding between them. So if there is only one thing, it's pretty usual, pretty close to the subscript. However, if the chloride chlorine had had a other than minus one charge, you would need to account for that. <clears throat> other questions? Do we feel like, my yes? How do you differentiate between the high and the low? Like high? Like chlorate? Mm -hmm. So chlorate is a polyatomic, so it would be CLO, I think. CLO, it's a chlorine with three oxygens on it, and that I would just, I would memorize those, because there's chlorate, chlorite, and perchlorate. There is a mnemonic for the like me, it doesn't help me. Like, it's the one where I'm always like, I don't know. So I'm a big fan of memorizing. If it is a single element, it's always an I, whether it's nitride, chloride, phosphide. It's when it becomes an element with friends. With friends, they have special names. I don't know that I love that expression, but we're gonna roll with it today. Questions, other questions? Yeah. I'd like to make an addition for her question, if that's all right. Sure. Um, I noticed when I was looking over the, the stuff that the eight always has another oxygen, so there is an order to it if you came over that, as opposed to the ice. That is true, but they don't all have the same number more, which is what, maybe that's a me thing, because sometimes it's that I get confused. Nitrate and nitrite have two and three respected, respectively. Phosphate and phosphite have three and four respectively. So it is that the ite has less than the eight. But I would prefer that it was always like, the one with three oxygens was this. That's kind of exactly what I was saying. Yes, which is why I made flashcards. That is how I learned all of these 500 years ago. Other questions? Sweet. So for what, I don't wanna say what little time remains today, but until we take the mini exam, what we're gonna to start to do is we're gonna talk about chemistry. 
And you're like, oh, we've been here for two. Yeah, in the back. Can I ask you a question that's like not related to that? Sure. Um, if we are trying to find like the, uh, the population of the planet, so the ice code, mm -hmm. is there any way that we could like use like SIGFIGs throughout the whole process, or would you only do it for the last process and keep the whole method throughout the whole process? Every time you change mathematical types, whether it's multiplying, squaring, any of those PEMDAS thingamajiggies, you should account for your significant figures. Because in the NSI code, they, uh, they didn't account for it, so I got a different number than they did for the actual math. Like, you are off by, like, 0 .03? Yeah, or, For the most part, it shouldn't always matter. But for the atomic mass, that one does. Because you add and multiply, so you multiply first, account for your significant figures, add, account for your significant figures. Okay. Any other? Uh, it's not an off-topic question. Any other random question? They're not random. Just had normal questions. Sweet. So let's think about chemistry. So we're going to start. Chapter 3 is probably the first turning point. So the way this course works is we start with like some review, some weird stuff. Now we're going to talk about chemical reactions for chapters four, three, four, and four to five. Five has its own little, it's a lot of math, but six, seven, eight, and nine start to talk about electrons. And so we're going to learn where they are, and then we're going to look at what does this molecule look like in 3D. So we're going to take a step away from this straight memorization, because that's boring. We're going to move into this land of what is a chemical reaction? What does it do? What do we learn from that? How do we balance them? How do we, how do we make this work? Comma, why do we really care about that? So, oops. Yeah, do you have a question? That's OK. If you stretch and I ask you a question, it's not meant to be offensive is that I get ADD. I get focused. So chemical equations. This is your recipe. As you may or may not know, I like to bake. Baking requires a recipe. A recipe tells you what you need to make what you want to make. There are some people, not usually bakers, who just put stuff in a pot and it tastes delicious. That will not end well at my house. I like measuring and rules and like this, that, and the other. But a chemical reaction gives us a defined recipe for the products produced. So if we have a reaction that is A plus B goes to C. On the left, we have our reactants, otherwise known as ingredients. On the right side, we get our products. So our products are, what do you make? So if it is a bunch of baking goods, it would be your product. Cookies, brownies, cake, whatever. So when we start to think about this, it matters about the ratio. So a chemical ratio, which basically tells you how much A to how much B gives you how much C. Those are called the stoichiometric coefficients. This is the ratio of reactants and products. But ratio in terms of the idea of it takes two A's plus one B to give you five C's. And so we are not today, because we're going to take a mini exam. But on Monday, we're going to talk about balancing equations. And so as we start to think about that, we kind of want to be able to think about chemical formulas which are basically the ingredients. So chemical formulas are the types of reactants that we'll see. 
So if we have two, H2 gas. So here, this tells us we have two H, subscript two, and then it tells us a little G in parentheses. This is your stoichiometric ratio. In whatever equation there is, this means you need two of this quantity. This H down here is the subscript. This is part of the identity. And it cannot change. Where the stoichiometric ratio can change. So when we start to balance them, we can't change the identity of the molecule. We can just change how many there are. This here is the state, and that tells you about the chemical. If there are, well, there are lots of different ways we can see things. Here in GenChem, we only see them in four ways. We have S for solid, G for gas, L kind of scripty, for liquid, and AQ means dissolved in water. For chapter three, you're pretty much going to copy them out of the problem. I'm going to tell you what they are. In chapter four, we are going to learn how to predict the identity of our products and whether or not, what state they will be in. But to start in chapter three, we're just gonna start to think about what types of reactions are there? What does it mean for it to be balanced? What does it look like when we think about different states? What questions do we have about any part of this chemical formula or the states? So when we start to, yeah. We will use, we will not, we will not get all the way there today. So some of these questions will make way more sense on Monday. But the stoichiometric ratio, when we try to balance these equations, we need the ability to know how much is in there. Right, so it's and kind of like the difference of balancing like recipe for one egg versus two. Yes, whether you need one egg or two, because you can't really add a half an egg. Right. Not usually. Whenever So this means that you would have four hydrogen atoms, because hydrogen atoms, it turns out that they come as a pair. And we will talk about that. We have not mentioned that. I will mention that on Monday. So let's think about a chemical reaction. Before we get all the way into like some pretty serious chemical reactions, if we wanted to make Oreo cookies, we could have two chocolate wafers, Plus one, these are regular stuff, not double stuff, just so we're clear. Cream filling. And that gives you one Oreo. Now, if you were to write this as a chemical formula, you could have two C for chocolate wafers. These are solid plus CR, which is in this case liquid or cream, and you get one C2CR solid. This equation, every element that is on the left, the same quantity is on the right. All of them have states. So it is a balanced reaction. And all have states. I'm doing time math. Excuse my face. I'm trying to make sure that we stop in the right time to make it to 
mini exam. So in the next half second, we're going to start to talk about types of reactions. We're going to see five this year in this whole semester. So the first three, we'll probably only get through two. So the first ones are the combination and the decomposition. Two or more elements combine to make a single product. Where we have A plus B gives you C. An example of that would be two magnesium solid plus O2 gas gives you oops, two magnesium oxide solid. You guys will run this reaction in lab, I think. Well, in the past, you will run that reaction. And so the decomposition is almost going to be the inverse of that. Where our single product is going to decompose using heat into A plus B. And an example for that would be calcium carbonate, solid. This delta symbol, or this triangle means heat, gives you calcium oxide, solid, plus CO2, gas. For now, the way that we will arrive at these equations is either through a word problem, where it's like, Lithium gas and this combine together to make this product, and then you would have to know the names. Or I would give you an unbalanced equation and ask you to determine those. What questions do we have, if any, about decomposition and or combustion? Nope. Combination and decomposition. We didn't get to combustion. Sweet. If you wouldn't mind putting away all of your belongings, that includes everything you have, except for a calculator and 